Okay, so hi everyone, uh, Sean Mullery from Electronic Engineering at IT Sligo and what I'm going to cover in this lecture is we're going to look at how we get from photometry to geometry. So what I'm, I'm really uh, getting at here is the idea of trying to figure out um, you know, what are points in space from just the, the pieces of information that we, uh, you know, the pieces of brightness and so on that we have because we don't actually have points. So up, on, on to, up to this, this point, we talk uh, a lot about points in space. Okay, so a point in, in these individual points in space. But these don't really exist unless we define them with a coordinate system. Okay, so individual points in the, in the space around you, they don't exist unless we, we can actually give a coordinate system for them to, to say what, what you'll put a number to them. There are an infinite number of points in the world. Um, even if we, we start cutting it down into, um, into discrete sections, we'll, it still goes on forever. Um, we talked about how points mapped to images, but really it's, it's not the, the point that maps to the image, but the brightness of the point that maps to the brightness intensity value or color at the pixel. So that's important to kind of be, be aware of that, you know, um, if you pick a point in the middle of the air, so I can just grab a point somewhere here, wherever it might be, you can do the same yourself at home. Well, that, that's not a point. There's, there's nothing there. It's, it's, there's nothing there until I put my fingers there. Now, now my hand is there and that's fine, but, but there's, no, there's no real point there um, because there's nothing reflecting off it. So um, is there any point uh, in asking what that maps to? Well, no, there isn't really because it's, it's, it's blank space. Um, there's no reflectance of it. And so you can assume that there's, there's nothing there apart from air. So likewise, a completely black object in the dark wouldn't map to anything. That's not air, it's an object. But if, if, we can't, if we can't see the thing, well, then it doesn't map to anything. Now, obviously, that's going to be a problem in autonomous vehicles if you can't see the thing. But really, there's very little point in us trying to determine the 3D geometry of something that we can't see. Um, so for, for us to be able to, do, to try and get um, the geometry of the world, we have to first be able to see it. There must be some reflectance of it. Um, and so points are really uh, brightness values. Uh, that then come into our image as image intensity values and we have to figure it out from there. So this is important because when we want to reconstruct the 3D world, we will start with images and images don't contain points. They contain brightness values or color values. Okay, and we, we sometimes use those words interchangeably, color values and brightness values, we'll often use them interchangeably because effectively, once they're in an image, that, that they're, 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 they're same idea. So. So uh, the measure of these values is called photometry and we need to be able to make uh, an association between these color values and the points in the image so that we can then associate those points with the points in the 3D space um, which correspond to the objects of interest. And this is important as well, the objects of interest in the space, it's not the entire space, we'll never be able to, to build the entire space. So this makes the job of feature recognition in images very important. So that, that job that you're doing in, in your assignment there um, and all, uh, you know, all the things that have come after that, this job of being able to find features in images is very important because if we can find the feature in an image and we can find it in another image and match those two up, we now have something that is a, you know, effectively a picture or brightness of a point. And it's that point we can then work back to getting just points in space and try and build up a 3D world. So by features here, I'm, I'm referring to primitive features such as edges, lines, corners, and primitive shapes. I'm, I'm not referring to this idea of object recognition, which is generally considered for, um, you know, these, uh, uh, kind of bigger uh, uh, objects um, usually reserved for, for like, uh, or co composite objects is the word I'm looking for, um, like cars and people, which are built up from obviously edges being built up into shapes, being built up into then th those shapes coming together to, to build up into a larger object, okay? We're dealing with generally just features here because what we want to do is we want to be able to pinpoint um, where points are in a space and we can only do that from the reflectance values that come off them. So as we saw in the section on perspective projection, 3D information is lost. So we've, we've lost that, that, that information. So we cannot determine 3D points from a single image, first of all. Okay? Um, oftentimes when we look at a 3D image, we can get some idea of what the 3D world must be like, but we can also be very easily fooled if the perspective is from a particular position. So instead, um, we will need to find corresponding points in more than one image, which is our more than one perspective, and from that infer that the 3D point, where the 3D point must be. This means 
recognizing features as existing in two images despite being imaged from two different perspectives. Now that's not as simple as it sounds simply because of the fact that when you look at something from a different um, point of view it doesn't necessarily come up as this, this, the same brightness. Okay. Uh, and we've, we've all the worries around that. So later we'll look at different methods for doing this, but for the moment you need to be aware that this is necessary in order to move from photometry to geometry. So uh, moving on from what you're, what you're working on in the assignment there, where that, we where that went to was in being able to find um, features in images and being able to describe them in a real, uh, in, a, in a rich manner that allowed you then to um, to be able to recognize that that was the same thing in another image, okay? So now not every pixel relates to a point that is useful to reconstruct uh, a scene, but uh, the question arises as to how many corresponding features must you find between two images in order to determine the 3D geometry of the space. So you've got two images and you're trying to say, well, okay, how many... How many point correspondences do I need in order to rebuild the space? Well, to be honest, you could have every pixel in, in both images together and you still wouldn't be able to reconstruct the entire space because there's an infinite number of points in the space. And secondly, you may be, you, 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 you've got two views of it, um, but you may not be able to see everything from those two views. There will still be things that are uh, hidden or the word we use is uh, occluded uh, from, from a thing. Okay, So we can't build an entire thing from that, but we might just say, well, okay, how many how many points are we going to try and reconstruct from this, or what's is is there an answer to that? And the thing is, that there is not a simple answer to that question. Okay, um, so to determine um, the camera intrinsic and ent extrinsic parameters, we have a set number of unknowns there. So if you if you think about uh, the ca the camera parameters. There's a translation involved and there's a rotation involved, which we know how many degrees of freedom there. We can start counting them up. We can count up the number of degrees of freedom in terms of a translation. And we can determine, we can try and figure out things like the focal length or the, you know, the, the scaling factors for the different pixels. So there's, there's a countable number of parameters between the extrinsic and um, intrinsic parameters. Uh, and for that reason then, if we have enough points, uh, a little bit, you know, like going back to simultaneous equations or when, you know, when you go beyond that and you start using matrices, what you can do um, is you can, you can basically just get, it, get enough points so that you have enough equations in the, you, you know, to determine all the unknowns and you can calculate those things. So the, the motion of the camera and the projection of the camera, that can be figured out from a relatively small and, and given number of points. OK, but once we get that and we then start reconstructing the, the world, we then have to decide, well, how many points in the world are we going to reconstruct in order to try and get a, get a view of what the world looks like? So for 3D reconstruction, however, the truth is that the more points that you try and reconstruct, uh, well, the more accurate will be the reconstruction, but the more calculation and memory will be required. And we all the time have this problem of we, we don't have infinite computational budget here. Um, uh, so we're going to have to decide what are the, the most important points to try and find. So few points means the, the reconstruction of fewer points in the 3D space, um, but it also means less processing time in the reconstruction. Okay. So let's think about uh, the autonomous driving case. What do we need? So do we need to see... You know, if, you, if you've got a car in front of you and there's raised writing on the back, you know, telling you the make and model, do you need to be able to see, you know, do you need to be able to see the three, di three dimensions of that? I mean, obviously you could read that off the back or you could read number plates or you could do those things, but I'm talking about, do we need to, the three dimensional information of that? And I would say, certainly you don't. That would be of, of no benefit to us to be able to see, to, to see the three dimensions of that. Um, do we need to see all the contours of the car? And what I'm getting at here is, if there's three cars in front of us, should, from the 3D points that I, that I recreate, should I be able to figure out if that's a Toyota Prius or um, a, a Land Rover? Okay. Um, now, you might be able to tell something about the size of it. If we took two cars that are similar in size, like a Ford Focus and a Toyota Prius, should I be able to tell those shapes apart? Okay. Um, or would just a very basic box 
do the job satisfactorily. In other words, that we can determine that there's something of that physical size there in front of us. So in autonomous driving, real time is important and processing load is important. Uh, so Vin is asking, do we have a depth filter for prioritizing? You know, is, so uh, to, to, to be clear on what you're asking, what you're saying, what you're asking me here, I think Vin is, um, do, do, are, are we only, are we more interested in points that are close to the camera than ones that are further away? Is that, is that what you're asking me? Yeah. So I mean, uh, I, I, yeah. So yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I've, I've taken up your, your question wrong. But as, as regards that, yeah, this, these are the decisions that that we have to make, and it really comes down to what our, what our computing power is, and, and what we're cap, what we're capable of doing from there. So with regard to, you know, the, 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 the shape of the car, uh, on, on all of those little intricacies there. We probably don't need to know that. We probably don't need to be able to tell different styles of car apart, but we certainly do need to know that the car is there, okay? But if you think about the idea of a basic box around the car, if that misses something like a tow bar or a, something bigger like a bike rack that's on the back of the car, then that becomes problematic. And so your margin of error then becomes, well, if you can only see a box around the car, You've then got to decide, well, how much room around that box do I have to give when I'm doing my maneuvering? So I think you're doing uh, statistics and probability at the moment. So you'll have a, you know, depending on how confident you are in the in the information that you're getting. In other words, how confident are you in the 3D points that you've you've actually got? Then you've got a whole Gaussian distribution around that. Add to that then, well, OK, even if we've got that, we've only got a few points. So therefore, how much of a margin of error are we going to give ourselves around that? And it quickly becomes something that the margin of error could become so large that you can't park a car very easily around this if you can't see those. So this is where the, the decisions have to come. Uh, and it, I won't be able to give you the answer to this. This really comes when, you, when you're working in a company doing this um, as to what's your computational budget and therefore how many of these can you do? Um, uh, and therefore, from that, what can you what can you figure out? So one thing is clear, and that's that there will have to be a compromise. Yeah. So so this is the thing. I mean, because part of the problem. So Vin is asking the question. There it was a very good one. Is does this mean that the computer decide the item category first and then go for the details? Um, Possibly, but also possibly you may be able to determine just from purely to do with the positions of where things are. So, for example, if you're finding lane markings and so on, they're going to be in a particular region and they're going to be, you know, from that you can normally figure things out. But for something else, it might be useful to be able to have something that recognizes that um, there's a person somewhere in the picture or there's a person and they're localized here. Now I need to build up a 3D world from that. So um, that's where a lot of the, the mechanisms of deep learning and so on might be quite useful. Um, but also, uh, um, Maurice mentioned it there, HOG, Histogram of Oriented Gradients. You can all, uh, they, they were the techniques that came along maybe just before deep learning, which were kind of the state of the art in, in determining what was in an image. Um, so that can also be useful as well, that they need to decide what the thing is before they decide if they're going to try and build it up. And certainly that would be useful, but not always possible. Um, so sometimes what you've got to do is you've got to build up uh, a certain number of points within the world and maybe from that trying to determine what it is you're looking for. So sometimes it goes in the other direction. Um, we might do it in the, in the other order. So reconstruction from a small number of points uh, is called sparse. So if we, if we try and do a reconstruction with only a small number of points, we generally call that sparse. And this term sparse shows up all over the place. If you're dealing with very large matrices and most of the entries in it are zero, we would call that a sparse matrix. Okay, so it's, it's not a term that's specific to our community here. Um, whereas reconstruction where we're using lots and lots of points is generally called dense. Now there's no obvious border between these two as what, what goes beyond the border of being sparse into dense. Um, so these are somewhat fluid terms and they will change depending on what is the computational power of computers at a given time. But you should get used to them though as they, they, they have uh, many uses throughout maths and science and engineering. And generally it gives you 
a good indication as to what an algorithm, you know, what way an algorithm is, is going to act if it's dealing with sparse or dense um, it would give you some sense of what you're going to be seeing. So as this module is aimed at the autonomous vehicle industry, we'll mainly look at sparse methods. That's not that they don't use dense methods. Uh, it's simply that the sparse methods will generally be much more um, uh, computationally manageable. And therefore, uh, if we were going to cover something, that's the best place to start. And beyond that, then if you go into some of these, uh, if you go into a company and they are using some dense methods, that's something you can learn on top of that. Going the other direction is not the obvious way to go. It's not the obvious way to start with dense and then go down to sparse. We'd normally work the other way around. But be, so do be aware that dense methods exist and they, they could easily be used uh, within, the, with the, within the companies that you might work for. Now, if we wish to find points in two images that correspond to the same point in the world, then we need to determine something about the distance between the two camera views. So if we can assume that there is only a small difference between the two views, then this opens up algorithms and options that are not available if the baseline uh, between the views is large. So what, what, this, what I mean by this is that if we've got two camera views and we know or we have a good idea that they were taken very close together, then that means that our search within the image can be over a very small area and that opens up all sorts of algorithms to us. If, however, we have no guarantee or we're fairly certain that the gap between the two cameras was large, then we can't use those methods and we have to stick to methods that try and just go around and find um, the, the, the pixels and try and, try and, try and match them or try and tries, to, tries to find a patch and tries to match it, but it could match to anywhere within the other image or it may not even be in the other image and, th and that can be problematic and a bit more difficult to deal with. So it sounds like the small baseline is much better, um, but small baselines often make reconstruction, um, in other words, reconstructing the 3D world less precise. And the reason that they're less precise is that um, when you don't have a big gap between your two views, it's much more difficult to determine the range that something is at. Okay, so our eyes are a certain number of centimeters apart, but um, if we were f if they were further apart, we would actually be able to tell depth much better. We'd have very wide heads, but we, we'd be able to tell depth a good bit better or with more precision than we're currently able to do. So. If our eyes were, were really close together, almost on top of each other, then there's very little difference between that and just having a single eye. Um, and it's the same with cameras. So the, the small baseline has the problem of it's difficult uh, or it uh, has less precision when it comes to actually um, recreating uh, the three-dimensional world. So usually the further apart the two views, the more precise the depth estimation. So in the wide baseline, we normally have, uh, have to have a much richer detail in our feature descriptors in order to spot the difference from uh, views that have, uh, have changed so much. So therefore, the, the sort of ones that you're looking at in your assignment uh, become less, less useful because they're, they're a fairly simple descriptor of what's there and you want to move on to more um, robust methods uh, such as SIFT that I mentioned earlier and HOG is, is not a whole, whole pile away from that although it's used maybe slightly differently. Uh, it's often desirable to use a, a combination of the two. Um, okay, so it's often, what I mean by the two here, it's often desirable to use a combination of both small baseline and wide baseline. And oftentimes what you can do is you can use the small baseline between maybe seven or eight different views and then find yourself from one end to the other and try and figure things out from there, which then has a wide baseline. Uh, so the lines between small and large baseline are also, uh, as I say, becoming blurred with time as small baseline methods improve and begin to stretch their range. For example, we can work on several resized versions of, of images. Um, so what you can do is there's a, um, uh, a technique called uh, an image pyramid, which is uh, one of the things from my from my list. If you look at the um, uh, at the syllabus, it's in the syllabus, but I don't know whether I'm going to get time to cover it. I would have covered it in the first two lectures had there been time. There's one or two things I had to drop, and that was one of them. Uh, but if I get a chance, I will come back, fill it in at the end, and if I don't, well, then uh, you can always pick up on it again. Um, the idea here is basically with a pyramid that what we do is we have several different resizes of the image, uh, image from very low resolution to high resolution. So what we can do is we can look in the low resolution version uh, of, the, of our two images or of our two views and find things that match and then work our way up to the higher resolution in order to actually find exactly where they are. That can work to, to some extent. 
So for the rest of, uh, of this lecture, we'll be looking at the small baseline or sometimes called the small deformation model. So normally the small deformation model does not originate images from multiple cameras, but instead the images are generated from a single moving camera. So if you imagine the case of an autonomous vehicle with a front mounted camera on it, that is a moving camera and it's taking um, maybe 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. And from that, we're trying to, um, we're basically treating that as if these are two different cameras uh, each frame is a different camera from a different view, but in effect, it's the same camera and it's just moved in some way. So we we treat um, the intrinsic parameters the same because it's the same camera, but the extrinsic parameters are the movement that the camera has undergone with it being attached to the car. So this, of course, means that the views are not just separated in space, but they're separated in time as well. And that can be a bit problematic if things move about during that time separate from the camera movement okay so for the sm uh, for the small baseline we make a number of assumptions but the most important of these is that the views have a very small displacement in space and time so what we're assuming is that uh, it hasn't moved far so the two views are very close together but also they were taken very close together in time or otherwise everything falls apart because we can no longer assume that it was a static scene so even the video, uh, even with video at 30 to 60 frames per second, this limits the speed of movement as the gap between frames could be large or something within the view could uh, could move between frames. OK, now I haven't done the calculation, but you can do it yourself. If a car is traveling at 100 kilometers per hour, what's the gap between between frames? Um, so you just have to work your way back to, well, how many meters is it moving per second? And then try and determine from that, um, you know, what's what's going to be the gap between frames. Uh, and it can turn out to be quite considerable, uh, particularly at the edges of the image. So in the autonomous vehicle setting, the camera or other cars can move quickly, um, but at least they do tend to move smoothly. OK, they don't tend to, to uh, in other words, they don't... Um, uh, they don't do a Star Trek on it and suddenly be able to jump from one place to another. Um, uh, what's the teleporting or whatever? Uh, they 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 move in a smooth fashion, uh, so that so that can be a little bit easier and are generally predictable. I know you've probably seen drivers on the road that are unpredictable, but th but there are different levels of of what we would refer to as predictability. And generally, the movement um, of of vehicles is is a little bit more predictable in terms of where things are likely to go. <coughs> So for small displacement, um, classic uh, optic flow estimation can be used. And this dates back to 1981 when separately Lucas and Canade and Horn and Schunk uh, came up with algorithms for it. So while Horn and Schunk was a, a dense method giving a displacement for every pixel in the image, Lucas Canade's method was a sparse method. And um, as we're more interested in sparse methods for the moment, we look and concentrate on Lucas Canade. Now at the time, uh, and certainly during the, the 1980s, Lucas Canade was much more popular than Horn and Schunk. It took, up, uh, it took off much more quickly. And the reason for that was that computers were, were quite primitive at the time and they, they couldn't really handle the, um, the dense methods. And uh, it just took too long to do anything. So it, it, didn't, it didn't get an immediately useful thing. It was more a blue sky scientific idea from Horn and Schunk. And so it took quite a bit of time for their work to then become quite useful to people where they then said, we now have the computing power to do dense methods and we move from there. Um, so that, that, that can kind of happen in, in, in these uh, research circles. So the analysis of flow is used throughout sci uh, science and engineering, but optic flow refers to apparent flow. And what we're talking about here is um, within an image, how do things appear to move about within the image? Now that's very different from how they, they appear to move about in the real world. How they appear to move about in an image is apparent flow. So how do things flow in an image? So i.e. the flow in a perspective image. Now an, an example here, um, which I don't know is if this is uh, apocryphal or whether this actually happened. It's a, it's a story I've heard to do with autonomous vehicles, but I can't quite picture how, how, this, how this might occur. But there's an autonomous vehicle and it's on the highway and it's going along at whatever 100 kilometers per hour when very suddenly um it it applies the brakes for uh reasons which were not apparent to the um to the human uh, occupants who were you know the the safety driver that was behind the wheel um and of course you know when you jam on the brakes that hard uh, on on a highway or a motorway uh, the chance of, of of danger to cars behind you is quite extreme 
Um, so this, this, this caused quite a bit of concern. So when they look back at the video footage, what they, what they, what they assume happened was that um, in the other lane was a vehicle that had a bicycle on the back. And as they closed on that vehicle, uh, it appeared to the computer software that it saw a bicycle and it saw a bicycle on a trajectory that looked like it was going to um, uh, collide with the car. And that was to do with the closing, uh, your one vehicle closing on the other. The apparent view of the bicycle was that it was moving in the direction of the car and therefore it jammed on the brakes. Because of course, these things are often quite primitive. Even the deep learning techniques will not necessarily be able to tell the difference between a bicycle um, that's sitting on the back of a car and a bicycle that's being cycled by something, somebody. So if we are looking for that and we're then trying to figure out, okay, that's on a trajectory and it's going to meet with us, um, and then it applied the brakes. Now that doesn't quite work for me because um, if we're approaching the back of a, uh, 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 of a car, the impression I get is that the overall image will be, be becoming bigger and that the bicycle will be moving in the other direction. But then again, that will also be the case for a bicycle that is moving in our direction. It will, it, it will give some apparent motion in the other direction and there may, be, may have been all sorts of corrections for that. So as I say, I don't know if that's an apocryphal story, but it does just give you maybe a sense of the fact that uh, apparent view within an image is not the same as the actual view or uh, uh, your apparent uh, uh, movement is not the same as actual movement within the real world, okay? So we make some assumptions. This looks like a fairly uh, sparse slide here, but uh, it's an important one nonetheless. We make some assumptions with the optic flow and the assumptions are that the scene between views is static. Now, of course, it, we don't have to go far before this falls apart, right? The scene between views is static. That assumes that if we're in a car and we're making some small movement, that nobody else makes a movement during that time. That's clearly uh, absurd and, and and that is of course going to happen but from our view that that change may be very different uh, may be very small and clearly we want to move up from from uh, algorithms like this in any case uh, but this this is the, the the situation back in 1981 this is what they're going to assume that the views um the the scene between views is static the movements are rigid so they can't deform okay um so they can do rotation and translation but they're not going to do um that, you know, they're not, they're not going to in some way uh, um, uh, deform uh, in, in another way beyond that. And the third one is brightness constancy, which um, from the term you can assume that it means that we assume that brightness stays constant, but we need to maybe uh, give a little bit more detail on what exactly that means. So um, the maths has returned, as you can see, okay, and there'll be a bit of it here tonight, but you should recognize some of it from, from other stuff that we've done. So the brightness constancy assumption can be defined as follows. Let x of t denote a moving point at time t. So within the image i x t uh, is a sequence of images in a video. Um, then what we have is we have this, this situation here where this is our position uh, within an image. And this is obviously images over time. So how the images change over time. And we're assume, assuming that the, the brightness stays constant with relation to both of those okay so one is to do with where things move in the image so from frame to frame if i take some dot here okay so from frame to frame from time to time that could move from this position to this position and we're assuming when it does so it doesn't change its brightness but we're also assuming that from frame to frame the overall brightness in the image also does not change outside of that okay so to maybe give you the, uh, an explanation of the two things that can possibly change here and that we're assuming that both stay constant. Um, imagine that uh, some, something of interest to us, let's say a cyclist, is moving and in one frame they're in the shadow of a building and in the next frame they suddenly come into the bright sunlight. Now in that case we don't have brightness constancy because what has occurred is that the, the, the particular set of pixels that we're interested in have moved from one position to the other where the illumination on them is much larger or much smaller. Okay, uh, So it could be either of those. So we're assuming that, for, that as these move that no change in brightness occurs to them. But the second thing we're assuming is that from frame to frame 
the brightness doesn't change, which means that the sun doesn't suddenly come out from behind a cloud between one frame and another and make all of our values suddenly come rising up. Okay, so both of those need to remain constant. We're assuming that all of those remain constant um, in order for this to work. So we don't know what the constant is. That doesn't really matter. But if we take the derivative of a function that is constant, um, we should get zero. Okay, so if you take a derivative uh, of something with respect, uh, and we're taking uh, the derivative of the, the uh, brightness here with respect to time, it should be zero. And if we take basically our function here, what we end up with is, and we have a few different things, we have the gradient within the image here. This is what we're looking at here. So this is the gradient. So what's the gradient of brightness from pixel to pixel uh, in the x and the y direction? And we want to multiply that by the derivative of our pixel with respect to time. Okay, so our, our sorry, I won't say our pixel, but our position with respect to time, because we're moving about from pixel to pixel. And we also need to add to that um, the partial derivative with respect to time of the overall brightness of the image, okay, and our, 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 of the illumination that's uh, on the image. So if we take all of that together, it should stay constant. We're assuming with, it, with our assumption. Uh, our assumption may not be right, but at least it's a, it's, a, it's a good assumption to start with. So if we take the derivative with respect to that, we now have some form of an equation to deal with, which I've, I've re-shown here, the equation here. Now, what we're looking to find out is how points or pixels have moved in the image. Now, remember, when I say pixels, I basically mean it's moved from one posi pixel position to another. Um, so we're looking for how things move about within the image, which is basically this bit here. And unfortunately, um, that's the one thing that we can't compute. So we can't, co so we can't actually compute all of this because this is the bit that we want to find out. So this is given by um, this is is given by the one uh, thing that we can't compute here, which is the derivative of the pixel's position with respect to time, which is what we want to find out, uh, because we want to see how things are moving about in time. So we'll call this velocity vector v, okay? So we'll call it, so, so rather than say dx dt, we'll just say v, and that'll make things a little bit easier. Uh, and do remember that when I say x, I'm of course referring to a full coordinate in the x and the y position, okay? Now, we'll just, I, I want to stop as many times as I can here just to make sure that you, you stay with me on this. The whole point here is that we want in an image to find something out about movement where one thing moves from one place to another the reason that's useful is that if we've got a second image and we can see that something has moved from one place to another we can figure things out from that okay so if we can track things within images okay so from one image to the next we see that we were there and now we're here well now we've got something along the lines of um of our views and we've got the same point in the different views so in this one it was here maybe and in the next one it was here uh, so from that we can then start to figure out um, correspondence points so being able to track where things would likely go helps us out in terms of determining what the movement that took place so it's all about finding that philosophy vector now unfortunately we can't solve this very easily because it's wrapped up together okay so this is all wrapped up together and this thing, this velocity that we have, we can't find that velocity on its own because what we'll do is we'll find it with relation to this bit here, which is the direction of the gradient. So we're only going to find out the amount of the, you know, the velocity within the direction of the gradient instead of the actual direction that it was going in. So we'll only find one component of it if we do that. So unfortunately, we cannot solve this because um, that's, by the way, this symbol, if you ever want to refer to it, is nabla. It's different from delta because it's to do with the gradient, okay? So this is nabla, nabla i transpose uh, dx dt results in the loss of any part of the velocity vector v that is not in the direction of nabla i t. So however, we can, we can make a further assumption and you can see that th this was the case that the, the guys were in back in 1981 or probably 1980 or 79 when they were first developing it. It, it came out in 1981. Um, you know, they're constantly having to make these assumptions and, and you have to do this all the time. You have to constrain what you're doing and say, well, okay, I'm only dealing with this and I'm only dealing with this and I'm only dealing with this and so on. You have to constrain what you're doing. Um, so, however, if we make a further assumption that there is a constant motion, 
in some small neighborhood of pixels, then we can try to find the best vector V that solves the equation. So basically what they're saying is here, okay, within a small neighborhood here, we're going to assume that they're all moving in the same direction. We don't know what that direction is. That's what we want to find out. But we're going to make the assumption that they're all moving in the same direction uh, within a small neighborhood. So what we can do is we can, we can check this for loads of pixels, check the gradient at loads of pixels and so on, and the brightness at loads of pixels. And what we'll then do is we'll be able to... Um, you know, minimize that function in some way or try and find out, you know, v via, the, by, via the normal methods, the least squares sort of method, um, we will try and uh, work our way back to figuring what was the movement, okay? So we've got our formula here and we know that that, uh, that is equal to zero and we're going to say that that's equal to zero for all of the pixels within some window. And the reason we've called this x prime rather than x is that what we're saying is, well, all the pixels, with it, all the x's within that window, but do remember that this window might not be just some simple rectangular window. It may, in fact, be uh, a Gaussian window or something like that, where we, we take into account that the further things are away within this patch, the less precedence we give it. So that's why we've, we've changed it to x prime now rather than x, because it's, it's been changed in some way. Okay. Um, so what we'll do is we'll we'll get the um, we'll get that uh, and then we've changed our d, dx dt to just our v variable there our v vector um, and what we'll do is we'll we'll do a kind of a, a least squares idea on it so we'll, we'll we'll square it here and we'll add up over the the whole patch and we'll try and find out you know in the least squares idea um, where is its minimum point okay. So L is the loss function or uh, our cost function, which we want to find the lowest value of, i.e. we want to find the velocity vector V that gives us the smallest loss. Ideally, this loss would be zero. So if it, it, because ideally it should be zero, but we may find that it doesn't come exactly to zero and we just want to get as low as we can. And that's likely to be our velocity vector via our assumptions. So to find the minimum of the function, we'll find its derivative with respect to, to V uh, because obviously v is what we want to find out and we'll set it to zero and we've done this a number of times now we've mentioned it a number of times and i'm sure you, you did it uh, plenty of times in maths before you've got some um you've got some uh, uh function let me move that to another position to make it easier on me you've got some function and you want to find where is the derivative zero because that's likely to be either a a um, a minimum point or a maximum point um, and because that this is a, a quadratic function, it's going to be of this form here. So therefore, if, if no, it's not going to be square like that, it's going to be of this form here. So therefore, um, if we find uh, a place where the derivative is zero, we know we found the minimum point of that. And so this is the, the fastest way to, to minimize our loss function. So we can expand the terms out, uh, square them. Does this look uh, does this look similar to anything you've seen before? Can you remember seeing anything like this before? So, no. Okay. So, uh, Maurice Maurice has seen it before. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 very similar to what we went over in lecture two and what you're now doing in your assignment. Uh, is very similar to this in, in, in what we've done. You're going to see a lot of the same stuff coming up. Um, so we, we were trying to find out something different in that lecture uh, and in those algorithms, but you're going to see the same maths appearing again uh, to try and find the same sort of things because we're looking at gradients within images and so on. So if we get the derivative of this, firstly, we can lose any terms uh, that do not have a V component in it um, because they won't affect the minimum. Now, the reason for that is that we can, uh, if it doesn't have a V component in it, it's effectively like being a constant when we do a derivative. So when we do a derivative, it's just going to become zero. Okay. So we can remove any of those that don't have a V component in it, such as that one. It's gone. We're left with the other ones. Um, a little bit, you, you, you may, not be obvi may not be obvious here, but we've got V uh, transposed by V over here, which is like having a variable that's V squared. And if we get a variable that's v squared and do a derivative of it with respect to v, we're going to get 2v. So that's what we've ended up with 2, and that's where our vector is over there. So that's why we've lost this vector along here. It came out as part of the derivative. The same here, 
uh, we just have one v here we don't have a square of it so if we just had v and we got the uh, you know by some constant we'll just call it cv and um, if we get the um derivative with respect to that we'll just have c okay so we'll just be left with whatever whatever is that bit is the, is the bit that's left okay so uh, and we sum up over all of those and we set we we set that to zero in order to try and find where is our our minimum position so um We'll make the following matrices uh, to make our life a little easier because uh, when we do that uh, multiplied by that transpose, we end up with this this matrix, which again should look very familiar to you from from lecture two. Um, so we've that one there and the sum over it, and we'll just call that M. And we have uh, we'll have this, which will be a vector Q um, with, with the, the two parts of information there. And what we basically have is we have the derivative of the image brightness with respect to time and this is the derivative in the x and the y direction uh, and the, the, the two are multiplied by each other there okay so we can basically change our formula from here which is two times all of that to just two times m times v and two times q and because we're saying that that should equal to zero when we do a derivative of it we can actually find v from that what we would do is well firstly if it's equal to zero we can just divide across by two and we have mv plus q equals zero and then secondly uh, we can put the um the q over the other side making it a minus so it would become mv equals minus q and then what we do is v and what we would normally do is we divide by m but of course we can't divide by m uh, we have to get the inverse of m. So the inverse of that matrix there. Okay. And that works only if m is invertible. So m may not be invertible. And we'll look at the some cases later about where that may not be invertible. And if it's not, what happens? Um, but it has to be invertible for us to actually be able to, to calculate our vector here. So what does the velocity vector v actually look like? Okay, so because we mentioned it there, but what, what does it what does it look like? What what sort of a thing is it going to be? Well, as we are in the image plane, we can only move in the x and the y direction, so no other options are actually available to us. So the velocity vector v will be a two-dimensional vector or three if we give it in homogeneous coordinates. So it'll be basically uh, we we'll, we can call it u v, and we'll put in one just to pretend that we'll, we'll we'll say for the minute we're in homogeneous coordinates, and u might tell me how far I'm going to move. Uh, in the x direction and v might tell me how far I'm going to move in the y direction. So uh, at least uh, that's what the, the original Lucas Canada paper made the, made the assumption, i.e. under small movements the motion could well be approximated by a simple translation. Okay, uh, We'll look at a, an example in a minute where the, the motion might be a little bit more complex than that but it still has to be uh, in the, in the two-dimensional plane. So as, uh, as this is optical flow and therefore motion in 2D, then translation only has two degrees of freedom. Um, so we will call this version of the velocity vector V uh, TR for, for translation. So when we minimize that, uh, we work through it, we get, uh, we, 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 we get our, our, um, our vector v, uh, v translation, which this is just a repeat of what was on the last slide. Um, and once we have that, what we're basically saying is that if we want to find out the new coordinates from the old ones, so if we know our position in a previous place, we can say, okay, now add that uh, VTR to it, and that will tell us where we've now moved to, so our new, uh, where our new position is. Um, I've called that v, uh, x prime there as our new position. Don't mix that up with the, the x primes that we, we, were, we were using here, which were just related to what was in the W. So maybe I'll call it x hat instead is what I'll do just to keep those separate. I'm just referring to its, its new position. Okay. Um, so that's how we would do that. We'd find out its new position um, by, by adding the velocity vector to it. And if we know that, then, then from that we're, we might be able to uh, track points and from that be able to tell maybe over 10 or 15 frames where one point has moved to another, another position. And now we've got two, two images that are maybe 15 frames apart. There's a good gap between them, uh, and, and yet we, so we've got two quite different views. Uh, so we've got a, maybe a larger baseline at that point, and from that we can actually figure out maybe more about our 3D geometry. So it's all working up to that idea. So now consider the following. 
you have a front mounted camera on a car and it's approaching an object that is head on. Okay, so you're, you're, you're coming straight towards it, right? Um, the object will not move in a translation. So if we take, for example, that I've... Um, So let's say I've got, I've got my phone here, okay, in your camera view. Now, a translation would look like that, or would look like that, or something like that, or maybe over here. But I'm talking about the thing where this is coming towards you, and you can see that it doesn't translate. What does it do? It gets bigger, doesn't it? Okay, uh, it, it, it gets bigger in your view, but if you've got a single point on this that you're tracking, let's say just a point on the corner, and that comes towards you, that point stays in the same position in your in your frame to some extent if you're coming along the optical axis so individual points may not be moving about the image in any way so we need to kind of consider well what's going to happen there in that case so the object will not move in a translation but the object will will get bigger now this along with rotations and translations comes under the heading of affine motion um, and it's very it's it's that that similar motion that we looked at before. Where in other words, you you're 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 keeping a certain amount of things, um, you're preserving a certain amount of things. Uh, the shape is maybe staying the same or whatever, but um, uh, but it can become bigger or smaller. Um, it has six degrees of freedom um, related to it. However, we still need to make a move for each pixel in two D. Um, and our M matrix is a two by two matrix. So how do we get the six degrees of freedom into the equations that we had above? Because we're, we're, on, a, we're on an image and we're looking at a parent motion. You can say that we have six degrees of freedom, but I can only move an X and Y. So what am I going to do? So um, we'll call the affine velocity vector VAF and we create a two by six matrix out of our X, Y and one homogeneous coordinates as follows. So you can see our our x, y, 1, 0, 0, 0, and then 0, 0, 0, x, y, 1. And with our um, velocity vector as follows. So these are our six degrees of freedom that could possibly happen within affine motion if we've decided to model that. Okay. And again, this is a decision as to which we decide to model. Okay. So th those are our four, our, so our six, uh, sorry, um, degrees of freedom. So what we do is we multiply these by each other. And in doing that, we end up with a velocity vector, which I'm, or, you know, sorry, with a movement, which we'll call ux. And you can see what will happen here when we multiply this out. We have x by p1, y by p2, and 1 by p3. So that gives me p1x plus p2y plus p3. And those add together to give you a single value. So a single value for what's going to happen in the x direction of, of velocity. And then we have... Uh, we'll have 0, 0, 0 by those first three, and then x by p4, y by p5, and 1 by p6. And we get that. We get that number for the uh, what's going to happen in the y direction within the image. So this is how we encode our six degrees of freedom into just the, the movement within the image. So note that ux is not the new value of the coordinate, but the change in the coordinate. Um, so the new value of the coordinate will be given by x plus ux uh, as to where we're going to go. This is just the, the, the maths of that. And what I've actually, all I've done is I've added in that into the velocity there, <coughs> into what we did previously. And when you do the squaring of that, you're going to end up with a, a transpose of that there and an ordinary version of it here on either side of our M matrix. So that's that there with our M matrix and then with that. And so when we work it out, all we need to do is we, we get that and we get an inverse of it. Um, now, previously, what we did was we got the inverse of M, which was a two by two matrix. And we said we, we worried about that being um, invertible. In this case, what we're going to have when you do that is you're actually going to have a six by six matrix. And again, that needs to be invertible, but that will be mostly determined um, by whether M is invertible because the, 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 the other ones will be fine. So it's uh, it'll, it'll come down to whether that is invertible, whether the, whether the other parts are going to work. So it's just a six by six ma matrix that you have to get an inversion of and then multiply by Q. Okay, so um, there's one major problem in the mathematics of Lucas Canade, uh, which um, can cause it to fail entirely. And that's whether the matrix M is uh, invertible or not. So if the matrix M is not invertible, then the velocity vector cannot be recovered. Um, 
what would cause m to not be invertible okay so remember now m just have have a, a thought process about what it is between pixels it's saying from one pixel to the next what is the gradient so what's the gradient in the direction of x and what's the gradient in the direction of y is really what that's encoding so let's say for example we had uh so i'll um i'll just take it i won't do it with that uh so i'll draw some pixels here and have another pixel here beside it and another pixel there and one there one, one there 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 and there okay now let's imagine that uh, i want to know what's the difference between here and here and you can see um yeah, it's, sorry, well, it's, in, in, in the general case, what you'll be doing is you'll be doing it over the full window, uh, Vin. But I'm showing the kind of s the simple case where we're just looking at each one on its own. But you'll normally do it over the full window and add it up um, is, is what will happen. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't go up in there. So if I look in the X direction or I look in the Y direction, can you see how the value of the pixel hasn't changed? Because my background here is white. Okay. So there will be zero gradient in all of those corrections, okay? So um, Maurice is saying, so when, 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 when the derivative is equal to zero, exactly. So when the derivative is equal to zero, and it actually, it, it, the, here's the thing, it could be like this. Um, you could have this situation here where I'll uh, paint those in, okay? Now we have a situation where the gradient in this direction is zero but the gradient in that direction is definitely not zero okay now the problem with that is that within our matrix that's still going to leave us with um it's not going to leave us with a zero matrix but it is going to leave us with a singular matrix it, it won't be invertible okay because we could we could move along in that direction um so uh, if the window wx has an entirely constant intensity uh, now, I've, as I say, as Vin has correctly said, uh, you know, do we do one pixel at a time? No, we do a full window. But if we do a full window of these patches and it's all white or it's all some other color um, and it doesn't change, or if we're on the edge of one of these patches, uh, we have what's called the aperture problem, which is basically that, in other words, I'm looking at a small little section here down on the thing and I can't see anything around it and I, and I don't realize where the important things are. So... Um, if it has an entirely constant intensity, for example, a very black road surface, for example, or the flat side of a vehicle or a lorry uh, would, would give you that problem. So uh, a constant intensity in the spatial, do uh, spatial domain means that um, nabla i or x equals zero, and therefore the uh, I -X, uh, or it x equals zero uh, for all points in the window. And that's no use to us, because so, basically m will just be equal to um, equal to zero, 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 which is of course a singular matrix determined to zero. So it's not invertible because it's full of zeros. In the situation where the window straddles some edge, where there is a gradient in one direction but not in both, then M will not be entirely zero, but it will be a singular matrix um, with determinant M equal to zero. Um, I'm trying to think, can, could we figure out what that was? Well, if we look at it here, if the IXs were zero, then we'd have zero, 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 and something. Uh, so, so some, we'll just call it A here for, for some, some value, okay? So that's, the, that, that's what we would have, which would definitely be a singular matrix, as you can see. So while this is under, undesirable, uh, all is not lost in that case, because um, we can still compute the motion in the direction of the image gradient. So we can still compute the motion maybe in the Y direction in that particular case, just not in the x direction. Um, so if, if it came down to it, we could maybe do something there. Um, uh, I.e. The, uh, 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 the part we have a gradient for. This would be called uh, the normal motion as the gradient is normal to some edge. But in the general case, what we're looking for is we're looking for something um, where the, the, the determinant of this matrix is, is, um, is quite big so that that, that we're seeing um, we're seeing big changes in both directions. Remember, if you go back to your the eigenvalues of that matrix that you're looking for looking at in your assignment, the bigger those were, the bigger your determinant was going to be. So obviously, if we've got a big determinant, it suggests that we've 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 got something um, something that we can work with there. 
So this is the, the, the final slide here, and this is a simple feature tracking algorithm. And so what we do is we're assuming that the matrix M is invertible. For a given time sample uh, or frame, compute each coordinate X, Y in the image frame, uh, uh, the, the matrix M. So we have it there. And basically what we do is we, we compute it for each pixel and then we, we add up over the window with the weighting of the windows that are there. Mark all coordinates uh, for which the determinant of M is larger than a threshold. So you decide some threshold theta, um, which is bigger than zero, obviously. Uh, zero is no good to us. So if it's bigger than some threshold, the determinant, we assume that it's pretty good. Remember, it can be a little bit dangerous to work with determinants that are pretty small because they're very close to being a singular matrix um, and it probably doesn't tell us a whole lot. You could be just looking at small little bits of, of noise in an image. For all those coordinates um, that, that have the determinant bigger than this, this threshold that you set, um, the local velocity vector can then be calculated by getting the inverse um, and, and using the, 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 the function that we have there. Um, and basically, you know, this looks a little bit more complicated, but all we're, all we're doing there is we're, um, sorry, where is it back here? Ah, I probably passed it. Yeah, so the, the, um, this bit here, uh, by, the, by, by the relationship here. So that delta I is a vector. Okay. And that's why we're seeing this and it's, it's over that window. Uh, so that's why we're seeing this, which looks a bit complex, but actually it's just two numbers of a vector. And um, so that's going to be our Q vector. Uh, and then what you do is, uh, once you've, calculated the velocity you move your you assume that your point moves to there and there and you repeat the above steps from that position okay and remember that the brightness constancy that we're talking about it really only has to stay constant between this image and the next image it doesn't have to stay 10 images out so as long as uh, because those those won't be perfect when you do your your minimization you should find hopefully that you, you still find your, your vector to there and once you're in that position, then you start from that brightness value and you work to the next. So hopefully from one frame to the next, there isn't much change. If there's a major change between two of the frames or something like that, um, then you will have a problem and you may lose that point in your tracking algorithm. So remember, this whole idea here is for tracking. Uh, but beyond that, if we can track points, then we know between two images where, uh, where the same point or the, in space has appeared. And from that, we can start working out uh, the rotation that our camera has undergone, the translation that it's undergone. In other words, the camera that's mounted to our car, where has it moved? Um, and we can then, from that, try and figure out something about the three-dimensional world that the car is looking at as well. They're, they're, uh, they're two problems that are, are, are kind of locked together. And in, in the next few lectures, we're going to be looking at how we get those separated from each other and, and try and work from there. Okay, that's it for tonight, guys. Uh, so thanks very much for your attention. And I will see you uh, next Tuesday.